Welcome to episode two of Weird Realities, Inc., a spinoff of Weird Realities, where James Irby and I talk with you, the writers and the filmmakers who are in the field researching and investigating the world's most fascinating, strange, and inexplicable mysteries. Tonight's guest is Matt Adams. Matt is based out of Boston, Massachusetts, and investigates stone chambers, balanced rocks, petroglyphs, and ceremonial centers across New England. He focuses on Native American and early colonization, but has made um, and participated in some interesting discoveries all around the Northeast. I think primarily Maine. Is that right, Matt? No, no, I'm, I'm in Massachusetts, so pretty much all over the Northeast. Okay, all right. Well, James, I'll let you take it over from here, and uh, let's get started, guys. I'm excited to hear what you have to say, Matt. Great. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the ancient world or think about, uh, you know, things that uh, touch the ancient world. You know, a lot of times they don't look to, uh, you know, the Americas and stuff, but there's a lot of culture here uh, that's oftentimes forgot about or overlooked. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about this. Uh, so, Matt, can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what got you into this field? Sure. When I was 24, my ki- I had two kids at that age, and they were about uh, probably three and five, four and five, four and six, somewhere around that age. And I took them out to do something. And we went to the Salem Wax Museum in historical Salem, Massachusetts. And there was the spindle of books and it caught my attention. So I was looking through them and they're all different topics about New England and history and all kinds of stuff like witches, pirates, lighthouses, Navy battles, Revolutionary War, all kinds of stuff. And one of the ones was this book called Ancient Mysteries. The author who authored all of these books was Robert Ellis Cahill, if you want to look that up. Now, this book was both important and detrimental to me. And the reason I say that it was because it sparked my interest in the things that were out there. There were things that I could go visit, that I could look up, that were near me, that I could spend time at and look at and study and wonder about. And I spent a lot of time wondering about what these things were, but my access to information at that time was very little. And that will be important later because I'm going to explain why that was detrimental. But I just want to point that out here at the beginning. Gotcha. Uh, so immediately I was interested and I, I, at the age of 16, I had a membership at my local public access TV station. And I was interested in making my own productions, you know, whatever it was. And so when this, this interest captured me um one of the uh, first things i wanted to do was go down to the new public access station in the town that i was currently in at that time and and start work on that so the opportunity came up for me to do that and i i don't even remember how i found the organization nira the new england antiquities research association but I somehow accompanied them on a field trip to some local structures. One of them was unknown at the time. It goes by the name Turtle Mound. Um, It was on private property then. It is not on private property anymore. Part of that land has been deeded to the town. Uh, The house that was there was torn down. There was a new house across the street from this structure. Um, And it was finally figured out what it was. But at the time, people thought it was... um, an ancient structure and it was built by Indians and and that kind of thing. And and there had been some artifacts discovered in the area that led to that conclusion. Uh, But then there was some features about the architecture uh, that people weren't really thinking was Native American. They thought it was more European. And in fact, it ended up being just that European. But anyway, I went on this field trip and it was uh, time for us to clear away the brush from this from this structure and and sort of put some care into it. Um, It had become overgrown with shrubs and whatnot. 
and we were there to do that kind of work and, and look at it and study it and all of that. So I brought my camera that day or the one that I borrowed from the TV station and I started to film stuff. Uh, unfortunately for me, the audio jack or I plugged the microphone into the camera was faulty. So uh -huh. I had terrible, terrible audio. And if you know anything about video, the, the one thing you need to know about it is good audio makes a good video. If you're yeah. audio if your audio sucks, no one's going to, no one's going to watch your video. It doesn't matter. So unfortunately I had no, uh, I had, I had nothing to work with. I had no, um, no content. So, you know, at that point it was like, okay, well, I've got two kids, um, don't have a whole lot of money. What I do have is going into my kids and, you know, I just don't have the resources to work on that. Right. I'm right. Not, right haven't established myself. I've got two kids. Um, and so over the next 15 years, um, you know, I was self-employed. I had done a variety of things. I'd founded a music festival. I'd run that for five years. When that was over, I went to cosmetology school. I got my cosmic cosmetology license. I went into salons. Um, from there, I became a dating and relationships coach after going through some personal development growth. Um, and I had run events on Meetup as an event organizer. I had made money that way. I had also built some websites and, and that kind of stuff so all, all along through that. So um, I had this set of skills that I, you know, picked out what I wanted to do and sort of um, cultivated myself to be able to remain self-employed for that long. So uh, when my kids got older, in about, I want to say 20, 2016, uh, I moved. I had to move. I, it wasn't my choice. The, the landlord had asked us to move. And uh, so I spent all summer 2016 just dealing with that um, very unexpectedly. 2017 rolls around and I wanted to get out in the summertime in the spring and the summer. I just wanted to get out. I said, I don't want to have another summer like I did last year where all I do is move in the hot heat and don't do anything for fun. So 2017 was like my year of retribution. I am going out and I am hitting these sites and I'm going to go do stuff that I want to do again. So, uh, for the first few ventures, my, my kids were with me. I brought them and uh, my youngest son didn't end up liking the stuff so much, but my older son took a keen interest in it and really enjoyed uh, being in that same wondrous mindset that I had uh, touched upon earlier. Um, now in between that point, I had all of those old ideas from that book. I had still believed in those things. And those ideas were things like, um, there's a, a site called Druid, uh, Druid Hill in Lowell, Massachusetts. And that was one of the first sites that I went to. And the original name for the hill was Bridget's Hill. So there was this seeming Irish connection there. And then, of course, it's an egg-shaped mound with a bunch of standing stones. And people didn't know what it was. The context of it, it was lost. And when the book was written it was just kind of put out there as we don't know what it is and blah, blah, blah. Well, come to find out later on after that period in 2017, when I started really getting out there and, and I had more access to information, the internet had grown more. Um, there was more information available to me that wasn't before. And that included things like, archaeology reports, uh, investigation reports, and, and those were files that I found through NERA. And there had been um, an archaeological dig there, and they dug under the stones, and what they found was trash from the 1800s. So, oh, wow. So here I was, I'd been believing this Irish idea for probably close to 14 years, I think at that point. And like, I, you asked earlier about like, what will, you know, what were the, one of the moments where everything just changed? That was, yeah. one of them. it was yeah. like, it was like, Oh my God, I believed all of this. 
And I remember one day I was in, I was in the park that that little mound uh, with the standing stone sits in the middle of a park. There's like a couple of baseball fields there, a soccer field, a playground, a parking lot. And I remember one day when I had the kids there, they were off on the swings and I was wondering about the stones and like this maintenance guy for the park comes through and I'm telling him, like trying to convince him that this is like a 4,000 year old site or something. And like that hit me like, oh my God, it was so stupid. <laughs> Why did I do that? And I just felt so dumb um, that I had believed that without really any proof and that I would try to convince somebody else without any proof. Yeah. Um, so that was a major, major, like awakening moment for me um, when I found that out because it just shifted everything. Um, and so now I'm a lot more careful when I think about what certain things are. I look for evidence. I'm not going to just jump and say, well, it could have been this, it could have been that. I'm going to look for the evidence. Um, that said, there are artifacts that I've seen with my own eyes uh, that have been found here that sort of fall into the category of out of place artifacts. Mm -hmm. They're known for short as uparts, out of place artifacts. And they do lend to certain theories. So I'm not entirely closed off to those things. I just got to a point where I require a whole lot more proof to convince me because I've been wrong and, and even when I set out in, in 2017 with my older son, who, who continued on the project with me for a little while, and I'll, I'll touch on what the project is in a minute, but um, I remember filming at a site out in New Salem, Mass, different from old Salem, historic Salem. It's out in the middle of the state where Salem's on the coast. Um, I was at the site and someone took me there and I didn't, I didn't read the sign on the way in. I just wanted to see the site and experience it through a fresh set of eyes. And I had my own ideas about what things could have been. But then when I went back with a different set of friends, I read the sign and I realized what it was. And I realized again, that all the ideas that I had about that site were wrong. And I had completely misinterpreted the site. So these two experiences were just like very, very eye-opening, very, very like, hey, step back. Don't stay what things are, you know, right away. You might think yeah. there's something, but, and the thing is too, when, when you're trying to go somewhere with this, and I am, and I'll, like I said, I'll discuss that, but when you're trying to go somewhere with this, you have to worry about your reputation. You can't be putting things out there that make you look dumb. You just Right, can't. right. So well, it's, it's easy at times to get caught up in the excitement too. Um, oh, sure. Oh, you know, sure. And, and, and yeah, the excitement a lot of times leads to speculation and, and all that. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's good to be excited, but yeah, you're right. It's also good to, to kind of have your, uh, you know, your, your, all your ducks in a row. Yeah. And, and sometimes you just have to sit on the information that you have and, and let that pass. And it's really hard, but it's the best thing to do in the long run, because when you put something out there, um, you know, sure, you can put it out there with the disclaimer that, hey, I'm not really sure what this is, and I'm not saying that this is exactly what it is, but here's what I think, or here's what I'm thinking right now. That can still come back later. Um, right. because you, you went and, and put something out there when you weren't really ready to. So sometimes you got to be real careful about what you talk about. Um, and I, I, I know you guys had asked about, you know, hey, can we talk about this or that? And I'm like, no, that's why. <laughs> that's why. No, we understand. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just saying like, that's, that's why I, I just have to be careful um, about what I put out and that's why. So well, it, it makes you a more credible researcher. We totally understand that. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to be credible. The amount of garbage that I see people put out on Facebook and these different groups and whatnot, it's just like, okay, I can see where you're coming from, but you're trying to convince me that that's the hundred percent truth. And then somebody else who posts right next to you in the same group has a completely different idea. You're both not right. So what's the truth? You know, it, when it comes, and that's really what I'm interested in, the truth. I'm not yeah. interested anymore in ideas that are going to engage my imagination because that's where things go wrong. 
um, it's fun and it's attractive and, and a lot of people want to engage in that kind of thinking, but it's not, it's not going to lead me anywhere. And I want to be taken seriously with what I do. So, um, yeah, I guess I, I mentioned the project I said I'd get to in a, in a minute. Um, in 2017, I picked up the idea of doing a documentary again. And so I thought maybe I would do like a two hour documentary and I'd film at these different sites and I'd present ideas and, and make a statement. But under, at that time, I was still under the idea that, you know, these things were unknown and they're mysterious and blah, blah, blah. The more sites I went to, the more questions I had about what it was that I believed. So even though I gave two examples of being like shook to my core about how dumb I was, hmm. uh, it, you know, there was still this longer period of awakening um, and I had more questions. And when I started to look into certain ideas, for instance, the idea that St. Brendan, when he left Ireland, came to America and built these uh, stone chambers that we've got up in the Northeast. Well, when I started to break that down, I reasoned out that it doesn't really make any sense. The idea was uh, he was gone for seven years. He came back. All right, so let's start breaking down the seven years. It's going to take, what, two, maybe three months to get from Ireland to here by boat. Uh, so there's that amount of time. It's probably going to take the same amount of time, maybe a little bit less because you got the winds going for you on the way back, right? Um, right? Assuming you don't run out of supplies, have to stop somewhere, whatever, right? Um, so that's probably a good six months out of that. So now we've got like six and a half years left, right? Well, um, a, a gentleman from Massachusetts named Jim Vieira, he's a stonemason. He's also interested in these types of things and, and some other topics. Um, I don't particularly agree with him on those other topics, but one thing I do agree with him, what he said was, um, and this is coming from his, his you know, 30 years of being a stonemason, it would take him about, to him and a, a team of people about two to three months to build one of these stone chambers. So, okay, let's deal with that as a time frame. How many people did St. Brendan leave Ireland with? I don't know the exact number, but we could say it was 20, 50, 100, 200. No matter which one of those figures I took and reasoned out, the timeline doesn't make sense. There are 700 of these stone structures oh, wow. in the Northeast. Okay. So when they take two to three months to build, um, no matter how you divvy up the parties of people, and they're all over the place, mind you. They're all like they stretch from Maine to New York. Yeah, so, yeah. And they're in every state in between. So no matter how you divvy up the teams of people, there's no possible way that that could have been accomplished. Okay. Let's not even bring into the argument the fact that archaeologists haven't found any kind of conclusive evidence that a, a group of people that big was here yeah yeah and they would have had to they would have had to have divided up into groups to make that happen in in the amount of time and the other thing is they would have had to provide food for themselves and they would have had to provide shelter for themselves and they had they would have had to have dealt with long winters you know, like you guys know what's going on down there right now. It's, it's yeah, pretty cold and pretty icy. You can't do much. Um, it's, it's a lot worse than that in the Northeast, uh, yeah. especially in the Northern parts of uh, like New Hampshire, Vermont. We don't see chambers typically in, in Maine so much, or I don't think that far North in New York. Um, they're more in like the Hudson Valley area in New York, which is close to closer to New York city. They do go all through um, Vermont, um, close to Canada, and they do go up sort of about halfway or three quarters of the way through New Hampshire. But, um, you know, so th these people would have had to have diversed uh, out through these, you know, this giant area in that amount of time. Um, 
to complete this monumental task. So it just, it, it breaks down when you start analyzing it and you start trying to get into specifics, it breaks down. It doesn't make sense anymore. Well, so that Matt, was really, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry I'm, to interrupt. I've got a question and I want to catch you before we go any further. Sure. These stone chambers, what were they used for? I mean, historically, what were they? Yeah. Were they so, for? so I realize that some of your listeners might not even understand what a stone chamber is. Essentially, um, it's a small room made out of stone walls and stone cover. We call them lintel stones. And a lot of times they're covered over in earth. And they can either be cooler in the summer or they might be a little bit warmer than the outside weather in the winter. Um, it, some of these structures, we don't know what they were. Some of these structures we do. Some of them are definitely root cellars and spring houses. And um, sometimes, depending on the size of it, we think they might be like a winter mausoleum, a place where, because our ground freezes, we can't dig a grave in the winter. So we'd have to store someone's body somewhere. Um, and this would be a potential place to do that. Um, other times when we think of things in, or, or through a Native American lens, we tend to look at the opening of the chamber and where it aligns to on the horizon. And we do find that a significant amount of them are aligned to the Southeast or the Southwest. And that's important because that's where the winter solstice sun rises in the Southeast and the winter solstice sunset in the Southwest. Well, that's um, what I was curious about. Um, yeah. I'd looked through your photos and I saw um, a very similar photo to one I had seen of a place, I think in Ireland, that had the line, the lined up um, with the, the winter solstice. And I was wondering if that's what it was, but it's fascinating um, that people so far apart would be creating the same type of structures with, you know, no known connection. Well, that's, that's the easy thing to think of on the surface, right? And I think that's the same thing that a lot of these old time researchers did. They didn't have the, the access to information that we have today. Um, and when things, information got lost, there was really no way to recover it. Um, but what they did was they compared, oh, this looks like what's over there. Well, maybe that's because there are a lot of immigrants from that part of the world that came here and they brought their uh, building ideas with them. Um, there are a lot of colonists here is really what I should say. Um, and so a lot of these are built by colon colonists. They're on farms, old farms. Um, they're built in a way that is very recognizably European, but that doesn't make them as, as old as people think they are. Um, but they didn't know that at the time. And they, they looked at them and said, well, what does this look like to us? And so they said, oh, well, it looks like this. Well, oh, well, maybe people from 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago came over here and built them, right? And I'm not entirely against that. I, there's a very small uh, part of me that is still open to that. But the more I see of them, and I've seen about 80 to 90, close to 100 of these now, that's still only one seventh of the totality of them. Yeah. But the more I see of them, the more I realize, okay, well, when we see a square shape, it's probably European built. When they're not square and they're more round, that could suggest maybe it was a Native American uh, construction. So that's sort of what I'm looking at. And the other, the reason I fall back on those two is because those are the two people's that we know we're here for a fact. There's no arguing that. Um, artifacts in this area go back 12, 13,000 years. There's a site out in Western Massachusetts. Um, we just did some activism on a call the other day, uh, two nights ago now. 
Uh, it's 10,000 years old and the state wants to pave over it and make a, make a rotary there. So the site should be eligible to be on the National Register of Historic Places. And, you know, the local agency said they even agree with that, yet they're still trying to push the project forward. So um, we do have a lot of sites around here that go back that far. We know those uh, peoples were here. They're still here today. There's a lot of tribes out that way that aren't recognized. There are very few tribes here in the state that are recognized. Um, so it's, it's the way things happened. It's the history. Some of it's not great. A lot of it's not great, but it, it is what it is. And, um, you know, that's where we are with it. And that's why I think it's either colonists or Native Americans. We know they were here. So you've mentioned, uh, you know, some of the sites that you looked at early on and stuff. What are, uh, what are some of the bigger, more exciting places that you've been and, and uh, looked at? Yeah, so one of the coolest things I think of is this structure. I don't even know if it's a structure. It's a, an arrangement of stones, perhaps, is the right word or term for it. Uh, it's called Tripod Rock. It's in New Jersey. What is it? It's a 180-ton pink granite stone and it's propped up on top of three smaller stones underneath it it's amazing to look at it's absolutely stunning you look at it it just blows your mind and you think like who built it and there's a lot of people you know hey, who made it right and there's yeah. a lot of these ideas out there that are pretty wild well i when i first went down there i was blown away and I, I started, I didn't even go to that first. I started looking around on the mountain. This is down in New Jersey, I think I said, right? Yeah. Um, so they've got some pretty, pretty short mountains down there, but it is still a mountain nonetheless. It's a ridge. It kind of extends down like a finger. It's long and narrow. Um, but I started looking around down there and I found all these other things, all these other stone arrangements that look to me like Native Americans spent a good amount of time in the area arranging stones. Um, I found some alignments to the sun and different stone arrangements that just don't look natural. So I was like, okay, well, I'm sort of of the mindset that there were Native Americans here at one point. And eventually I made my way around to the other side and they've got a little visitor center and in the little visitor center, they've got a small display of some Native American artifacts that they found and some information about the Lenny Lenape who were there. So I was like, okay, I'm off to a good start. At least I, you know, came into this with the right mindset. So I go up there, hike up there. It's about maybe half an hour or 45 minutes, depending on how fast you can get up there. And when you set eyes on this thing, it's just gigantic and it, it holds your wonder. Well, I started looking around there and I saw some things that I was intrigued by. People already knew that there was an alignment to the summer solstice sunset. There's a stone next to this big tripod rock and uh, propped boulder. There's a stone there and they thought if you stood at the end of it and looked between two other boulders that are smaller, but still fairly large, or about four feet high. They have small stones underneath them that sort of prop them up and keep them in position. And directly between those, right in the middle, is where the summer solstice sun will set. Now, right behind that is a drop off in a gully. And then maybe a quarter mile away, there's uh, the rise of the next finger-like mountain. On that mountain, about, I don't know, almost probably almost 40 years ago now, there used to be a stone there that aligned perfectly into the middle of these two stones, and the sun would set directly on top of that. Now, thankfully, this um, sun-setting alignment had been witnessed prior to the destruction of that stone when a house was built there. Uh -huh. So we know that that existed, but part of it is, is now gone, unfortunately. So we know that that was there, that was documented. 
And the one thing that didn't make sense to me about this site was why would they stand at the end of this one stone and, and look out between these two stones? Like, what is the significance of this stone? It just didn't make sense with anything else that I had seen. So I turned around, just did a 180 completely on the other side away from looking at those two stones. And I saw one stone and it was cracked and it looked like a seat. So there were three pieces to it. And there was like a left part, a right part. And then in the middle of them was this other part that, you know, you could essentially put your feet there if you sat on the left or the right part. Okay. So it kind of looked like a little bit of a seat. And I was like, hmm, that looks interesting. Like, let me go sit there and see what I see. Well, from there, you get a perfect alignment between the two stones. So you can see the same thing you would see if you were standing next to that other stone. And I'm oh, like, wow. okay, well, this makes more sense to me. So then I took out my Sunseeker app and you can find that if anybody's interested in archaeoastronomy, uh, you can find that in the app store, the Android store, Google Play store, whatever it is. Um, and it shows me where the sun is going to be on solstices, equinoxes, and any day that I choose, right? The solstices and the equinox are, are there and you can see them, but you can also set it to be any day that you want. And you can see there's three different lines that come across the screen. Essentially, you're looking through the, the phone's camera and the app superimposes the path of the sun as a line onto the screen over the image coming through the camera. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Uh, I, I realize this is an audio interview. I've got to go into that so people really can visualize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, so that's how, that's how it, it reveals to you where the sun is going to be and where these alignments are. So I'm sitting in that, in that, on that stone seat, and I turn to the left a little bit from the summer solstice sunset, and I realize that the equinox sunset is and it's like please don't think this is anything special right now but the equinox sunset sets on top of the tripod rock okay um but so would any other number of days around the equinox and we're not talking about one or two days we're talking about probably 30 or more in either direction yeah. so it's not really that special um okay, it sets on top of that, no big deal. I turn even further to the left, and there's another stone that is sort of diamond-shaped and is sort of on its own little pedestal in a way. And there's a point that goes up, and then one of the other points comes down. And the winter solstice sunset just touches on that corner on the side corner of the diamond. So I'm wow. like, I'm like, oh my. So now instead of one solstice alignment, I've got two and a potential third. Yeah. Okay. So there was, I think I left and went home and came back and on another trip. And, and I was looking at this uh, tripod rock again and the weird thing about this, uh, the whole, it's weird anyway, right? But the weirder thing about this is that across the top of it, there's a triangular crest and it runs the length of it or the width of it, I guess, because um, it's the shorter of the, the two. Anyway, there's this triangle that, that sort of juts up out of the top of it if you look at it from the north. And, and when you look at it from the side, it just looks like a long ridge. But I was looking at it as I was about to leave the site for the second time. And I noticed, geez, that kind of that shape on it kind of looks like a guy's face. Like he's lying down on top of the rock, looking up at the sky. And I'm like, well, this whole thing sort of seems to be an observatory. Well, why wouldn't that make sense? Yeah. So the next time I went down, mind you, this is like a five hour drive for me. Um, from Boston to get there. So 
we're talking about like significant time investment to get down there to research this place, right? Um, please put your phone on stun. <laughs> so I get down there and I'm like, okay, I got to get up on top of this, uh, up on top of this per propped boulder and, and really look at this stone face that I think that I see. So I get up there and I realize like the eye is kind of notched out and I'm like, huh, where, like what's behind the eye? Now you could stand anywhere on the planet and you could look for a sun alignment. You're not gonna find one everywhere you look, okay? So I held the little sun seeker up or you know, my phone up to the eye with the sun seeker app and out of all the places that, that this could possibly align to, like out of the 360 degrees that it could possibly align to, it aligns perfectly to the equinox sunset. Wow. And I was like, I was like, oh man, so now I've got a third, I've got a third sunset alignment. That's just crazy. So I'm like, okay. I had, so I had my drone with me. I sent the drone up about 400 feet above the mountain, took some photos straight down. Um, there was an author and she put, uh, she published somebody else's map of the site. And I, I wanted to know how accurate it was because there were some things on there I, I wanted to just check and verify and couldn't get that on Google. It was too blurry. So I used the drone. I get home. I'm looking at the stuff like maybe three months after I got home. And I'm looking at the, the drone photo straight down and I'm somebody in a report maybe 40 years ago thought that that ridge, the, the, the triangular crest on top of the stone pointed north. And they thought it pointed north to a pass in between the next, like in the gully and in the next mountain. At a certain point when you go north, there's a break in between that mountain and the next one. And they thought that it pointed to there. So I was trying to check that um, on Google Earth and I extended a line. I'm, I'm looking at my drone photo to know exactly where the, the crest is on top of the stone because you can't get that detail on Google Earth. So I'm like trying to figure out, all right, how do I line the line tool up properly on Google Earth so I can check this to make sure that it, it goes where they thought it did. And I'm looking at this drone photo Oh, by the way, it doesn't go to where they thought it did. So I, I disproved that by trying to prove it. Um, it actually goes to the highest point on the next ridge, which is interesting because there tend to be things on the highest points around here. The higher yeah. you go, the more you see. So that's interesting. But as I was looking down at this drone photo, something popped out at me that I just couldn't believe. And this is why you got to be real careful what you publish. I'll just say that now. I'm looking down and I see a stone head that you can only see from the sky. Oh, wow. And my head just exploded. Now remember, <laughs> so be careful, right? Yeah. But, but imagine, you know, if you will, like how I'm feeling at that moment. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Like my head just blew up. Right. So I really wanted to publish that. I because it was just amazing and and I can send you guys I, Hadley you can you can include this photo after okay but, but I really wanted to publish this photo of the stone head so I didn't or I might have put it in my group and said hey look this is interesting but I wasn't like screaming it all over the internet right um so I was like, okay, like, here's a stone head. I know I called a couple of friends and I was like, ah. So, so I waited, I sat on it. I wanted to publish my documentary with that, but I waited and I sat on it. And I waited probably nine months from the time I saw that until the time I got back up there again, which is a equinox of last year. So March 19th or something. And I got up there with a geologist. Um, now, this guy had been a geologist for 50 years. He started off in Alaska. He's seen his fair share of rocks. We'll put it that <laughs> way. 
Um, I don't know anything about, you know, not to the level that this guy does. Okay. Um, and that's why I wanted his expertise. So I get him down there and he looks at the lines in the stone and the lines in the stone are there because that's how it formed. Right. So we're looking at the, the, the folding in the rock and, you know, bands in the rock. Yeah. Yeah. And so he takes out his Brunton compass and he shows me the stone like of the mountain somewhere else, somewhere like away from the stone head. And he's like, so we can tell that by the way this stone is aligned, that this is how it formed. Okay. And so what we're looking for is just the general attribute of the stone, which way it's moving or which way it moved before it solidified. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So then he's like, all right, well, we're going to go look at that stone that you think is the head and we're going to see where, like where that stone, where those attributes of the stone are aligned to. And if they're within a certain portion or a certain, I don't know, like left or right of center, right? If they're in that small margin, then we know it's probably the same stone as what's underneath it. If it's significantly different, then we know it it was placed there by other means. Yeah. So we do that and we go over there and he looks at the stone and it's pretty much the same thing. So I'm like, okay, so now we've got that piece of evidence. The other thing about the stone he pointed out is that there are certain places where it's broken that perhaps make it look like it has features that it doesn't. And he's like, okay, well, this part of the stone broke, which would be like the top of the head. This part of the stone broke from the lower part of the stone, which would be like the bottom of the head. And the reason for this is probably because there was ice under it at one point. And when all the ice melted away, the, the weight of the stone caused it to break on itself, hmm. a break in the middle. It's like, okay, well, that, that makes sense. He says it's the same stone from here to there, but that's why it may have broken. I'm like, okay, that's, that's fair enough. That's, that's good, solid quality evidence for me to believe. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, so it's not what I wanted to hear. Right. And I went home with that and I was, you know, part of me was disappointed because I really wanted this to be the stone head. Right. Um, yeah. And this is, why, this is why we have to be real careful with what we do. Um, I wanted it to be the stone head, but I went and I, I went and I sat on that idea and I said, okay, well, you know, oh, and the other thing was, I'll get back to that. But the other thing was, um, he described to me how the stone ended up where it is. Now, again, I said he was from, or he'd done a lot of work early on in his career in Alaska and he'd seen his fair share of stones in Alaska. He said, seeing stones like this, larger stones on top of smaller stones is fairly common up there. So there's a lot of stone that gets moved around by ice. Now today we don't see that ice. The Native Americans probably never saw that ice. Um, So if the Native Americans had come across this in its natural state, they would have likely lacked a a way for it to have gotten there, especially if they were further away from a time when there was ice there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I believe that the area was probably inhabited at the time there was ice there, or at least close by. And then when the ice started to retreat, you know, maybe the ones that were there at the time realized, hey, the ice put that there, right? It's possible. Um, but I think the further we we get away from that time period, perhaps that was lost. Perhaps that wasn't passed down. Um, and even if it was, they might have seen it and just said or believed that that would have been a sacred place. That right, there was right. something about the area that was sacred to them. And then that's why they would start to put these other things in position where that might be included in 
their arrangement of stones. Now, I fully also believe that they carved that eye, right? Because it doesn't look natural to me. It just doesn't. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get this guy up on top of the boulder. <laughs> he wasn't <laughs> going to do that, you know, not at like 70 years old. I was thankful just to get him up the mountain. I wasn't going to, you know, 10 fingers him up to the top there and be like, dude, really, what's your opinion? <laughs> as much as I wanted to. Um, so the, the jury's still sort of out on that one. Um, but I do believe it was man-made, that eye. Um, and the reason I do is because it just so perfectly lines up with the equinox. Um, if that's a coincidence, my God, is that the perfect yeah. coincidence, <laughs> you know? But again, there's some other things about the site that are just very strange, you know, and, and maybe they are coincidence and maybe they're not, but. So I've got a question and hopefully you can answer it. Why snakes? Okay. Yeah. So this is, this will lead into uh, where I'm, what I'm talking about here will lead into the snake. Um, I think I showed you a picture, maybe, I don't know. What, I you just told me about a, a snake, I think in, was it West Virginia? Okay, yeah, let me, let me get into that. Okay. Let me get into that. Um, there was one thing, though, that I just said I would get back to, and I don't, oh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the glacier moving the stone. So it's, it's tough for us to understand that there would have been like a thousand or more feet of ice moving stones this big. Um, and likely what happened was, there's a gully right there. The ice probably pushed it up at some point. And then when the ice retreated, maybe there was a whole bunch of stuff under that stone, not just the three stones that are there today, but maybe a whole bunch of stuff. Smaller stones time, or debris. Right. And over time, the dirt, whatever else was there, smaller stones probably washed away. And so this giant 180 ton stone is left there. Now, prior to him explaining that to me, um, that like, I, I just didn't have that vision. And when he did explain that to me, it's like, okay, yeah, that makes the, per that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Now, well, yeah. When you look at the pictures, it did, you know, you know, talking about it, three stone stacked, you know, I'm sure some people get an idea of it. The, the top stone is massive. It is massive. It's huge. Yeah. So the fact that it landed there perfectly, I, like I don't think it just was on top of three stones perfectly right then and there. There was probably yeah. a lot of other stuff underneath it. And then again, like when it washed away, if there was a lot of earth and other stone there, then you know that's how it was left. All right, so that's, that's my thought on that one. But let me transition to, to what Hadley just asked. Um, so I saw this, what I thought was a stone head from the air, right? Um, I'm going to skip now, jump to another site in Pennsylvania. I was on a field trip, a near field trip um, to one gentleman's land and we were looking at some stuff there. And one of the people on the field trip, um, her name was Heather. And uh, she started talking about some of the things that she had uh, down in or over in Pennsylvania, down where she was and I was intrigued. So I wanted to go. So me and this other guy um, decided that we were going to go to check out what she had together um, in a couple of days. So we went there. And as she's showing us some stuff at her house on her table, she unrolls this giant old like poster printout of an old uh, USGS photo. Now it's an aerial photo. It was taken by a plane in 1939 and it looks down on the area. And in that area, you can see that there's a stone wall in the tree line. Um, and it makes the shape of a snake. So it comes, it comes around, comes down, turns around like in a, you know, like if you were tracing your finger out, right? Right. right. The end of your finger it comes around like that. And then it goes back up and it circles around like an S shape and then goes back up off of the, off of the poster. So like the whole structure, the whole stone wall 
wasn't in this one photo. Wow. Um, and But when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, it's a snake. And so the first thing I did was like, hey, I called up my buddy. I'm like, he's in the Navy he's been, or was in the Navy for like 30 years. And he knows all kinds of research methods that I didn't know at that time. So I was like, hey, how do you get, you know, these photos like I need to find the next photo in the series because when they when these planes were taking these photos they were mapping the entire area they didn't just yeah, take one yeah. photo right so, so there's somewhere out there exists that next photo and I have to get it so with his help I, I found the photo and there it is in all its glory a stone snake the stone wall that goes around a mountain and Essentially, there's another snake entwined with it, which is how snakes mate. Um, and I asked Heather if there was like an eye down where the head was. And she's like, not only is there an eye, Matt, but there's a tongue coming out of the mouth too. And I'm oh, like, what? what? Wow. <laughs> so, all right. So that, that was another one of those moments, like both the head and the snake, right? Um, when I was like, the Native Americans had such a deep knowledge of the land that they were able to tell shapes, you know, maybe like they were looking at it from above. I'm not right. saying they had any kind of flying contraptions or not. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that they had such a good knowledge of the land from the ground level that they were able to probably draw it or trace out a shape on it or construct this stone snake on the mountain. And it, it like wraps around the side of the mountain from where the head is to the bend in the body and then back up again. It, it winds around the shape of the mountain. And it's this stone wall configuration that makes absolutely zero sense as a farm or would have been made by a farmer. It just makes no sense. Um, Hadley, to your question earlier about the stone snake in West Virginia, there's a myth or myths throughout Native American cultures, throughout the tribes, um, that permeated pretty much everywhere. The, the legend is of the Oktena, and that's a horned serpent. And so there are certain legends that involve the horned serpent. Uh, and that's why we find that symbolism over and over and over again. We see snakes of all different creations. So the one that I just described was essentially stone walls or stone rows laid out across the mountainside. The one in West Virginia that someone brought me to that they didn't know what it was. They just saw stones stacked and they had no idea what it was. I took one look at it and I just knew what it was. I didn't say anything to the guy who brought me there, not right away, but the very first thing that I learned when I went on that field trip with Nira and I had that bad audio experience with my camera, the very first thing I learned was let's take care of the site. Yeah. So that's what I taught him. And we spent the next hour and a half pulling branches off of the top of this structure, um, leaves. We cut down a couple of trees that were going to fall eventually at some point on that. They're small trees, uh, but we cut them down and cleared the brush away. And at a certain point, I brought him back to a certain you know, perspective where when I said what it was, he would just totally see it and he wouldn't ever be able to unsee it. And so that was his first experience, um, taking care of this. And then when he showed me that he would, you know, take care of the site, um, then I let him know what it was. And his mind was blown. So what is it? It's two stones on the bottom. They're, they're disconnected um, at their closest point. They don't touch each other. On the larger stone is this big, pile of stones that have been carefully placed there and that's the coil of the serpent and in between the place where those two large stones on the uh, on the bottom 
don't touch the neck of the snake goes over that uh. and then the, the, the neck goes out and comes to one big stone at the end which is the head and on that head you can see an eye and a mouth and a nostril and on the top of the stone is a small hole that when my friend later got in touch with a Native American man and showed him the pictures from that day, the Native American man said that there would have been a stick placed in there and that would have been the horn. Oh, wow. So, yeah, we came across that or he, you know, he and his wife had found it in the woods, didn't know what it was. The wife thought there was something special about it. And the trail goes right between that and a couple other stone or pot, you know, uh, stone structures, essentially all stones that have been placed there. Now he had found maybe, I think nine, they had found nine, but I looked a little bit more and found a 10th one. So now we've got 10 stone structures deep in the woods where there was never any farming. There was never any activity there. So you can't say, oh, these are, you know, farmers clearing piles. There's yeah, no way. Yeah. There was never a farm there. You couldn't yeah. farm there. Like this is steep mountain incline. You need an ATV just to get up to the top of it you know like you could walk it it's real tough you could walk it but you wouldn't want to so um we see that uh, there's one other type of stone snake too and it's usually a combination of the two types that i just said there's a big stone at the end of a long stone wall and i see that time and time again and a lot of times the big stone will have an eye that looks like it's pecked into it or a mouth or both a nostril. Like those features are there in the stone if you look for them. And these things could be thousands of years old. Um, real quick about stone walls. A buddy of mine is in real estate. He's been in real estate for 30 years. He knows people who do different jobs. One of the guys he knows goes to people's land who don't want stone walls on their property anymore and he removes them and he moves them to other people's property that do want stone walls and of course he gets paid on both ends right yeah <laughs> the one time he's digging up this stone wall and it goes 10 feet into the ground holy cow so we're talking like maybe an inch or so of of earth a year or every no i think it's maybe three or four inches every hundred years. That's what it is. Yeah. Three or four inches every hundred years, give or take, depending on how much uh, plant life is in the area, right? Um, it's going to be less on the top of a mountain where there isn't any trees and it isn't a lot of dirt, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so that three or four inches every hundred years. Do the math. 10 feet into the ground. How many, how many hundreds of years ago is that? Yeah, that's old. It's old. It's old. So we're talking, these things go back a long time. They predate the arrival of colonists. And there's only one population here that had the numbers to achieve such feats, the Native Americans. Yeah. That is mind blowing. It is, it is. Do you, uh... And looking at all these, do you see a lot of cultural differences or is it, is it a lot of, uh, you know, again, a lot of the speculation or, or can you tell that, that a lot of this stuff is, you know, from the ancient world? Well, when you learn about the Native American culture and you learn to see through that set of eyes, then you can differentiate between the structures, what you're looking at. Um, a lot of the old timers, the people who founded NERA and took part in NERA and came up with ideas um, for the last 70 years. A lot of the old timers didn't have the Native American mindset. Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't look at things through that lens. Some of them did, but a lot of them didn't. And they came up with these wild theories. Um, but now today we know more, um, the Native Americans the tribes are releasing more information um, because they feel like they have to. For a long time, they felt like they couldn't. Some of them still do. 
Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very, for someone like me, I care about preservation. I, I want them to share things because I feel that that's the way we can save these things. But they're coming from a place where they've been persecuted for 400 years. And they don't feel safe letting a lot of that stuff out. Yeah. Um, I had a conversation with a Native American woman from the Southwest. She knows that I know some things. It's obvious to her. She knows that she knows things that she can't tell me. And so I respect her boundary. I wish that she could. I wish that she would, but I respect that she doesn't. Um, but there's, there's a friendship there. And that friendship may take a long time, not just between her and I. I'm talking about culturally. That friendship may take a long time to nurture, to get to a point where both sides feel like they can respect each other. Yeah. I think it's one thing. In, that's just how it is. I think it's one thing in the world that people don't yeah. understand. Uh, you know, technology and, and stuff moves so fast, but at the same time, you know, the the longer time goes on, the less we'll know about things. Um, you know, especially things like this that uh, over time will get developed over, or just forgotten about. And I think it's real important, you know, for people like you, especially to get out there and 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 try to educate people on this world that exists that a lot of people don't even uh, aren't even aware of. Yeah, one of the most interesting things about the Northeast here, um, and this is how I connect it to the mounds that are out in the middle of the country, but one of the unique things about the Northeast is the amount of stone that has been moved. If you tally it up, it's about 10 times the amount of stone in the Great Pyramids. Wow. Wow, that's a lot. So the, the, the features themselves may not be as impressive to look at, as the pyramids are, okay? But the totality of it is more impressive, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it's all sort of hidden away. You don't see it unless you go look for it. It's, in a sense, it's esoteric knowledge, but it's also truth. So is there any, uh, any bucket list places you want to look at or anything out there that you're... Uh got your eyes on yeah definitely there's uh in my research i came across a photo of some stones over in portugal they happen to be in a museum and the guy that posted the photo is an archaeologist there and the archaeologists in europe are i, I gotta give them credit they have so much more of an open mind um than archaeologists here do that's sort of changing it's sort of shifting over time in, in America, not fast enough if you ask me, but that's a different topic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would love to go look at those stones in, in the museum in Portugal because the markings on the stone look very similar to the things that have been found here in Vermont and things I've seen in West Virginia. And I know by looking at the stone chambers that just because things look similar doesn't mean they have the same creator. Doesn't mean they yeah. have the same builder. So I'm very interested in <clears throat> sort of getting to the bottom of, of that because people take that and they'll say, oh, these two things look alike, therefore they are the same. And they use that as evidence to promote their own theory. Yeah. Are they actually the same? I don't think so. So Portugal, Spain, um, I'd love to get to Ireland and see that stuff. Love to check out everything over there. Wales, Ireland, Scotland, England, all of it. Yeah. Um, love to get to Iceland. Love to see the Viking stuff in Greenland. Um, of course, all the major places, e Egypt, um, the Mayan ruins, the Aztec ruins, the Olmec ruins, uh, a lot of stuff in Southeast Asia. Yeah. I, there's so much there's so much all the places matt <laughs> i know i know i don't ever want to stop seeing this stuff hmm. do you have any, uh, any upcoming projects or anything you'd like to talk about or plug yeah so the docuseries i've been filming now for uh, probably three and a half years going on four and i've been working on getting a membership site up because i want people to see the stuff that i've seen 
and I know the vast majority of people aren't going to travel to see them. So I'd like to make it easy for them. I've been working on this membership site now, trying to um, have a place to release my content. So that's coming. Um, I've got a book in the works. People can sign up for that and get on the email list. And then anything that um, I have to release in the future will be released through that uh, channel. So when the membership site is ready, when the book is ready, um, that will get sent out. The book is going to be free. I'm not going to charge anything for that because I want people, uh, essentially the, the book is a tool. And the, yeah. the, the job that it's doing is to create sort of an army of people equipped with the knowledge of how to investigate these kinds of things in the Northeast. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, I, I really want to work towards preservation. And the, the way we get to preservation is documentation. And the way yeah. we get to documentation is through education. So those are the goals of, of what, I'm, what I'm working towards. I first want to educate people on what's there. Then I want to send them out to investigate. And then they can submit information to us that um, we can then start taking actions on the, on the local town levels to get things protected. Um, I, I think it has to happen there first. Yeah, yeah. So, so when people like my, my friend in West Virginia, who he and his wife found that pile of stones and ended up being the stone snake, um, when, when they come across something like that, again, they'll know what it is when their yeah. friends or neighbors come across something like that at a different place, they'll know what it is. Um, and, and throughout that, we're essentially developing what I helped my friend develop is a respect for the culture. When they start to see things in the new light and they start to have that mindset of these are stone snakes, not stone walls. Not saying they're not everything's a stone snake, but you know when they start when they can see stone snakes and they can see uh, sun alignments and different stone arrangements and and they can see those things and they can uh, differentiate them between things that aren't anything that are just there. Um, that's when they'll start to develop the respect for that. That's when they start to take on the the mindset in the eyes of uh, the people who have been here for thousands of years. So eventually that's, that's where it's all going in the membership site. Like I said, there's going to be uh, the videos that I've taken of these places, site reports, photos. <clears throat> um, I'm working on, I would love to be able to do this. I don't know how it's going to pan out. Some sites are some, there, there are archeological societies in pretty much every state, not yeah. every state has one, but, there, there's a society in, in a lot of states. Some of them are giving their old bulletins away for free. And perhaps I can have a library of those inside the site. Other site, other uh, archeological societies are selling theirs. I just talked to one yesterday. I'd like to work out some kind of agreement where maybe I pay them a licensing fee or something, but I can include their journals and their bulletins in the library. And, and have them all in one place for people to come to like a digital library. Um, don't know how that's gonna play out. Would love to be able to do it. It's great information. Uh, it'd be great for people to look up the things in their state and get access to them. And I'd love to encourage people to donate to their local archeological archeolo societies and become involved with them. And I think that's a way to do that and work together with them uh, in a new way that benefits everyone and everything. Um, so, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic, man. I, mean, I think it's important, yeah, for people to, to really, you yeah, know, pour time and energy into this stuff uh, as they can. Cause yeah, once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's, like you said, there's a whole lot out there. And uh, so that's, that's fantastic. And your passion for this definitely shows through. So I really appreciate you talking with us today on this. Cause yeah, it's, there's a lot of cool stuff, a lot of interesting stuff. Um, you know, and a lot of, lot of, I think in this is uh, even small direction for people to start looking into things. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, Matt, I feel like we didn't even scratch the surface of what all I wanted to hear about. <laughs> we, Do you think haven't. at a later date you can come back? Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. Great. Uh, I just want to thank you and your listeners for giving me the time and letting me talk to you. Um, time is the most precious gift that we can give to anyone. 
So I want to thank you for yours. We definitely appreciate yours. We do. And Matt, when you get that docu-series up, let me know. And just so you know, I'm going to include um, all these places I have to find you on social media and your website in our um, description of the show. So people should be able to find you that way too. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. You have a good weekend. You as well. All right. Bye guys. Bye. Bye-bye.